other devices for 20 years. You'd remember to do that on Sunday, but we don't. All right, book of Proverbs. That's what we're looking at today. And I want to recommend, I know I did this before, but this is kind of the book and I've used it some for this class and, and then sometimes I haven't, but Know Your Bible by Frank Dunn. It's an analysis of every book of the Bible. Very helpful book. So I'm going to look at some of that today because we're looking at Proverbs today. And, uh, oh, does anybody need an outline, by the way, on the book of Proverbs? And we have some, I think Mr. Keith is going to handle that. If you need one, raise your hand and Keith Rose will get them for you. There's so much in Proverbs that it's, it's kind of like the Psalms. We're, and you notice we skipped the Psalms since we're doing that on, looking at that on Wednesday nights anyway. There's so much in this 31 chapters that you just, I, I suppose there's different ways of studying it. And I've, I've studied it or taught it rather kind of like a, in a topical form instead of chapter by chapter. So that was a useful study, I think. But anyway, a proverb is a short, pithy saying in general use stating a general truth. And that's extremely important here because sometimes the way people use specific proverbs is inaccurate because they don't understand that part right there. It states a general truth. Or piece of advice. And what that mean, when I, what I mean when I say a general truth is it states a truth, but it doesn't apply in every situation. And that, what, that doesn't mean like situation ethics or, or truth is dependent on circumstances. So I'll give, you the, I'll give you the most, I would say most misused proverb that there is. Um, and it, I think it just illustrates this concept of a general truth. Or piece of advice. So I think Proverbs 22.6 is the most misunderstood and misused proverb. Train up a child in the way he should go. And what? When he is old, he will not depart from it. And the way that that has been used over the years is to say, well, see, if you, if you raise up a child as a Christian and they fall away, when they get older, they'll come back. And that is not at all what the Proverbs writer is saying. Um, if you have a question about that, you can ask, but I just wanted to illustrate what exactly this is, what a proverb is. It's a, it's a general truth or piece of advice. Um, there's a lot of advice on rearing and disciplining children in the book of Proverbs, Okay. Well, as you guys know, if, you, if any of you have had multiple children, every child's different. And you don't handle your children the exact same way because they respond to things differently. They respond to different forms of punishment or discipline differently. They have different personalities. Um, and so there may be a proverb that talks about something along those lines that is a generalized truth on the, on the, on the um, subject of disciplining and rearing children. So that's, that's what this is, and we need to understand that. You've got at least three authors who contribute to this book. Of course, Solomon writing the first 29 chapters, and then the last two, chapters 30 and 31, we are told that chapter 30 was written by Agur, and 31 was written by Lemuel. And who exactly these people are, we do not know. But as you read those verses, they are attributed to them. The first verses, rather, of those chapters. Uh, 1 Kings 4.32 tells us that, Pro, uh, that Solomon wrote 3,000 Proverbs and 1,005 songs. Well, we don't have all of that, obviously, in the book of Proverbs. It's kind of like John, the way John ends his gospel in uh, John 21.25. He talking about the life of Christ. He says, I suppose that if, if all the books were to be written about the things that Christ did, the whole world could not contain them. And so, uh, kind of the same, same idea here. 
So that's kind of by way of introduction. Anybody have any questions or thoughts on any of that? All right. The key thought of the book is the fear of the Lord. And I have I've listed for you all the references <coughs> excuse me, that mention this idea. So the first one, of course, being Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And there's that constant contrast throughout all 31 chapters. And the first, really the first nine chapters kind of lay that case out. Lay out the case of Basically, what is the fear of the Lord? What does it mean to seek after instruction? What does it mean to be a fool? And there's that constant contrast between the wise man and the foolish man and how one will accept instruction and rebuke and uh, advice and the fool will not. And so our conduct in life, as we read through the book of Proverbs, should be based on this concept of the fear of the Lord. And we when we finished Ecclesiastes a few weeks ago, I'll say probably two months ago now, you know, we think of, of uh, Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, fear God and keep His commandments. And to fear God, we kind of laid out the case. What that means is you have, you, you know the character of God based on what's revealed in Scripture, and then you act accordingly. And we can't, we can't just simplify it down to, well, you're afraid of God or you respect God because it's, it's quite a mixture of both of those things. And then your conduct shows that you both fear and reverence God. And so the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's where it starts. And uh, perhaps, you know, perhaps that's the problem with a lot of, or perhaps that's the source of a lot of the problems in our world is, well, if, if knowledge begins when you fear the Lord and you don't fear the Lord, then you don't have the good, you, you don't have the best set of knowledge that's out there. So Proverbs lays all this out for us. Uh, and so the, the next line in your outline here, the book, the book speaks of duty to God, self, neighbor, family, and society at large. And so this, again, this book here, if you have it, is very helpful because he goes into more detail than I do here. Um, let's see. So on, if you do have the book, it's on, it start, he starts that on page 211, talks about the uh, personal duties in Proverbs, duty to God, of course he stresses the fear of the Lord, duty to self, um, he talks about pride and humility, uh, the pitfall of riches, that, that's quite a subject throughout the Proverbs because, well, who wrote it? The guy who would know, right? And he's writing by inspiration. So the pitfalls of trusting in riches, envy, uh, luxury, intemperance, anger, idleness, misuse of the tongue. And that's a, that's a big subject throughout Proverbs is the tongue. And so that's kind of going back up to that first line here, a short, pithy set saying in general use. And there are so many general concepts for living a godly life throughout Proverbs that it's kind of, well, I think it's good to break it down, like I said earlier, to like study it by topic and pick out all the verses on this one topic and address them. Duty to neighbors. Uh, there, and there's some interesting things about neighbors throughout the book of Proverbs and how you should conduct yourself uh, with your neighbors. Family duties. Well, and, and, th and I kind of lay this out here. Uh, the book presents itself as a father admonishing his son. And so I laid out, I gave you quite a few verses of that. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. You know, how many of us as parents would, <laughs> would love to have an opportunity to, to write a book like that and, and be sure that based on your life experience and your knowledge of the will of God that your kid would do what you instructed them to do at all times. Uh, if it were based in the fear of the Lord and in a knowledge of His will. So, there's a lot to that in the book. Familial responsibilities. Um, he talks about the contrasts drawn out throughout Proverbs, and that's, that's a very useful study. Again, the contrast of the, fool, the foolish man and the wise man. Uh, just a few examples 
Um, one's choice of companions reveals his wisdom or folly. Fools mock at sin. Well, the wise man doesn't mock at sin. He doesn't treat it like it's, you know, something that's amusing and, and cute. It's something that's serious for the wise man. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish man despises his mother. So that contrast goes throughout the entire book. Uh, wisdom, I put this in here for you, and I want to look at some of these verses for the next few minutes. Wisdom is personified. Okay, so what does it mean? What is personification? What, what are you doing or what are you trying to do when you're personifying? Hmm? You're giving something, maybe an inanimate object, you're giving it personality to describe something. Uh, and that's what, is, that's what happens with wisdom. It's personified. It's given the attributes like it can speak and it can hear. It's personification. So wisdom is personified as a woman crying out for people to listen to her and seek her. So notice here uh, in chapter 1, beginning in verse 20. Wisdom crieth without. In other words, um, I, I, like, I prefer the way the New King James reads here. Wisdom calls aloud outside. She's crying out to everybody, wanting them to listen to her. She uttereth her voice in the street. She crieth in the chief place of concourse. In other words, where the most foot traffic is. That's where she's at. And she's calling out to people to listen to her. Um, the opening of the gates of the city, she, speak her, she speaks her words and you can hear frustration in her voice. Verse 22. How long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? Um, and that simplicity, a lot of times in the book of Proverbs, is the concept of being naive. All right? And that's... <laughs> being naive is not always a good thing. Uh, that, can, that can bring about a, quite a bit of trouble in life. Gullible. That's another word I think of. That's not good. So how long, will you like, how long will you be like that? Turn, listen to me, verse 23. Turn ye at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make my words known unto you. So that is the personification of wisdom. It's represented as a woman doing everything she can to get people's attention and listen to her and to her advice. And that, like I said, really for the first nine or ten chapters, that's kind of the, that's kind of the tone of the book, setting the stage for then the Proverbs that, all the Proverbs that follow on the various subjects. Um, another way that's, that it's presented throughout the book, uh, starting in chapter 4, again, is like parents, they've got a child sat down who's, who's seated in front of them, and they're instructing them. Hear ye children the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law. You know, I suppose we've all seen this. You know, like I say, every child is different. Every human's different. But when we're thinking about bringing up children and instructing them in things, you know, sometimes you see people who, it's just like they're, they're born with a sense of, they have, they have good common sense. It's, it's like it's just there. And there are some people who it's not. And I don't know why. And then there are some who are very book smart, as we know, and can read and, and soak things in. And then there are others who are not. And so every, every human in that sense is um, different. Well, what the Proverbs does is, again, lays out these general truths for everybody. And uh, I give you good doctrine. Well... <laughs> If you're giving your child good doctrine, you don't want them to forsake that. Verse 2, I was my father's son, tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me. One of the things that there is no substitute for in life is experience. And that's kind of the way, <clears throat> that's kind of the perspective of the Proverbs. And again, if it's coming from Solomon, <clears throat> you think back to 1 Kings chapter 3 when he prayed to God. His specific prayer to God when he became king was, Give me a wise and understanding heart that I may judge this your people. He said, I'm like a child. I don't know how to come in and I don't know how to go out. And, of course, God granted that request and gave him other things on top of that. But 
You know, as we studied through Ecclesiastes a while back, that, that's, that records his experimentation in life with everything you could imagine. And it's, it's hard for us, I think, to, it's hard for me anyway, to, to imagine a man who had what Solomon had and to just blow it and live the type of life that he lived. But Ecclesiastes records that, and then Proverbs, to me, is like a, <clears throat> an instruction manual in general based on his experience. And of course, we understand all of this is being written by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Solomon's not just sitting down writing this stuff just for the sake of writing it. Um, and, you know, we've been talking about that on Sunday nights as we've been discussing the, how we got the Bible the way we have it. And Proverbs is one of those books that <clears throat> is a part of that inspired collection, as we call it, of Scripture. And so, the advice of parents to children, you know, I suppose all of us as parents, if we had things to do over again as parents, we'd probably do it, wouldn't we? We might change the way we handled ourselves in certain situations with our kids and, and adjust, but I guess that's part of life. You know, you, as you say, hindsight's twenty twenty. But and man, if we could take the book of Proverbs and and learn from it, that'd be a good thing. One of the things that's done here is pretty interesting. Look at the end of chapter 4. Somebody read for us Proverbs 4, 23 through 27, because this is, again, <clears throat> this kind of plays out throughout the entire book in a variety of ways. Somebody read Proverbs 4, 23 through 27. Watch what you say, watch what you see, watch where you go. I mean, that's, that's the book of Proverbs. And again, written by someone who has every possible experience in life. And then not only that, watch what you see, watch what you say, watch where you go. You stay away from evil, verse 27, and you don't deviate from that, from that concept that's in verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence. Um, it's, you know, it's very possible in life to get, <clears throat> you think as, as living the Christian life, it's a daily struggle. It's a daily battle that we are engaged in to uh, live soberly, righteously, and godly uh, in this present world, as Titus 2.11 says. And it can be, it can be a struggle, <clears throat> as we say, sometimes to stay on the straight and narrow. And to constantly be on guard. You know, so one of the admonitions in the New Testament for us is, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because you have an adversary. You have an enemy out there. And he's seeking whom he may devour. And we, we, of course, talked about that last week in the book of Job. Job was, or rather, uh, Satan was walking back and forth in the earth. He was looking. And that's, that's his nature. And this is his realm of influence. So as we are keeping our heart with all diligence, we've got to watch what we say, we've got to watch what we see, and we have to watch where we go. And so Proverbs lays all of that out in a variety of ways. Again, your, your personal responsibility to yourself and to those around you, uh, how you conduct yourself in front of them. Um, and then he says there at the end of verse 23, out of it are the issues of life. Jesus teaches that exact same thing in Matthew or, uh, Mark chapter 7. You recall his disciples were rebuked for not washing their hands before they ate. And he said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him. He said, it's those things that start in the heart and then that come out of his mouth or through his actions. That's what defiles a man. And so you have to keep your heart with all diligence. How do you do that? You watch what you say, you watch what you see, and you watch where you go. And then you don't deviate from the way of truth. And that's another thing. Somebody turn over real quick to Proverbs 23 and read verse 23. Proverbs 23, 23, please. There it is. 
You find the truth, you don't let it go. Buy the truth and sell it not. And truth is not subjective. You know, your truth and my truth, all this modern age relativism that we hear today, that's not truth. You don't have your own truth. I don't have my own truth. There is God's truth. Um, and you find that. You don't sell it. You don't compromise it. You don't deviate from it. And also, wisdom, instruction, and understanding. And uh, so again, you have that picture painted, if you will, throughout the book of a parent or parents, both a mother and a father, talking to their kids about, well, a variety of subjects. One of the things that the author talks about, and this is on page 216 of the book, he talks about the rewards of righteousness that are pictured throughout the book of Proverbs and just, just a few verses here. Proverbs 16, 8, 16, 8, better is little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Well, again, you think of who wrote that. A little, it, it'd be better to have, it'd be better to be poor and righteous than to be wealthy and ungodly. Well, he would know something about that, wouldn't he? The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 7. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. Proverbs 15 verse 3. And he goes on listing more. More of those concepts there. Any questions or any comments on any of this? And happiness. You know, you know, so Proverbs 3, for those on the live stream, he mentioned, Randy mentioned Proverbs 3.13. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. Those two should go hand in hand. Um, but it starts off with the word happy. You know, so many people in life, and again, Solomon being one of those, experiment with everything there is to experiment with to find that sense of happiness or that sense of meaning in life, I'd say that's more, more the idea, the fulfillment in life. And they try it. You remember what we talked about in Ecclesiastes? Wealth, wisdom, and women. And do you remember his conclusion when he, when he talked about all of his experimentation in life? Anybody remember what he said? Hmm? Well, that's what he said. There's a, I'm, it's, it's something I have in my head. But yeah, vanity, it's, it's like grasping for the wind. But one of his conclusions in Ecclesiastes was, as he did all that, he said, I hated life. Because he couldn't find fulfillment in those things. And that so many people look for fulfillment and meaning in life in the, in the tangible things. And that's not where it is. Because that stuff can be taken away from you in an instant, can it? The stuff that you can touch and... And use to get other stuff that you can touch and use. That can be gone in an instant. That's not where happiness is. That's not where meaning in life is. And then he, well, to go on with what Randy said there in Proverbs 3, look at verse 14. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver, and the gain thereof than fine gold. You can't replace wisdom and understanding and um, and again, finding fulfillment and meaning in life and one of, the, one of the thoughts that we have, and another thought that we have in the book of Ecclesiastes is we're told that God put eternity into our hearts. You know, there's a part of man that, is, that cannot be satisfied with, with, again, with any amount of stuff or any amount of people or any amount of experience. There's a part within us that can only be fulfilled in, I guess you would say, finding God and knowing His will and then living that out. Uh... She's more precious than rubies, verse 15. And all the things thou, thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, the book of Job. It's interesting because the, the poetic books of the Old Testament, uh, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, 
Ecclesiastes, and even Song of Solomon to some extent. They all touch on that, on that concept of uh, seeking this stuff out, finding it, you can't replace it, and there's so much to learn there. Anything else before we go on here? There's a couple particulars I wanted to look at real quick. Uh, Let's see here. Okay, turn to Proverbs chapter 9. This is still kind of, like I said, the first nine chapters essentially are setting the stage for for the rest of the book of Proverbs. Somebody read Proverbs 9 and... Read verses 7 through 9. This is another one of those contrasts that we see throughout the book. Well, that's, that's a very practical statement. And we've, I, I would say, probably, we've all seen that to some extent, particularly verse uh, 9, or rather verse 8. Do not correct a scoffer lest he hate you. Well, there are some people in the world like that, that they're going to go their way, they're going to do what they want to do, and you can, you can, hey, listen, man, let me, can I, let me give you some advice here, and they're just going to go their own way anyway. Well... Look over at chapter 10 and verse 8 because this is connected to that very thought. The wise in heart will receive commands, but a prating fool will fall. Some people just won't listen. And uh, that's a, again, that's a contrast throughout this book. Here's one. Look at also in chapter 10. There are some things that are mentioned a few times in Proverbs, and then there are, there are other things that just permeate the text throughout, uh, throughout. Somebody read Proverbs 10, 19 through 21. This is one of those things that is throughout the entire book. Okay, I've got verse 19 circled. I don't just have it underlined, I have it circled. I need that. And I would say we all need that. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. And I would say we all fail at that sometimes. And we, we could all, I know I could do better in that. But um, in the multitude of, I like that phrase. You know, you don't have to say everything that's on your mind. Because sometimes you just, you'll keep saying things and you should really be quiet. Well, that's a, that's a thought throughout the book, throughout the whole book. In fact, look at verse 32. The lips of the righteous knows what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked, what is perverse. They know their own ways, don't they? And it shows by their speech. Let's see here. There's, like I said, there's just so much here. Um, let's do this. Turn to Proverbs 15. I'll illustrate this concept of a general truth. You know, when we talk again about a general truth, it's a piece of advice that in some situations will work. In some situations it doesn't. And it doesn't change the truth, but you can adjust to various situations. Somebody read Proverbs 15, verses 1 and 2. Okay. The tongue of the wise man, or the tongue of the wise, uses knowledge rightly. One of the other things we're taught in Scripture for instance, in James chapter 3, is that the tongue is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. 
You know, we've tamed all kinds of animals, James talks about. You can control a ship with a tiny rudder and a horse with a bit, but that your tongue just, it, sometimes it loses it, doesn't it? And it can, well, as James says there in James chapter 3, it can set on fire the course of your, the course of nature, that is the course of your life. You can light it on fire with the way you use your tongue. Well, so that's a general truth. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly. Yes, but sometimes you, you fall short in that. Now, the mouth of the fool pours forth foolishness, and certainly that's addressed throughout the Throughout the book, throughout the book of Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs 17, somebody read verse 15. Here's another good bit of advice, inspired advice. Proverbs 17, 15, somebody. God has always called for justice throughout every age of man's existence. We know that justice is not always meted out, but that's what he has always called for. Well, if you justify the wicked, that's an abomination to God. He hates that. And if you uh, condemn the just, same thing. Well, that's it. We, any questions or comments before we close this morning?